Good morning, friends. Welcome to the CEC Reset Live Lecture. Dear friends, as you know that in our previous session, that is yesterday, we talked about classics of uh, American fiction. Uh, we uh, covered it till 19th century. Today also, we all are going to talk on classics of American fiction further and we are going to discuss on later half. And for this, we have again with us in our studios, uh, Dr. Bhim Sen Dahiya. Uh, Dr. Dahiya is a retired professor and I believe that he has immense knowledge so dear friends let's take advantages from his experiences and let's try to understand more about the classics of American fiction so without wasting any time I would like to welcome our guest Dr. Bhim Sen Dhaya. Hello sir welcome to the Edisit lecture. Thank you. Well uh, continuing with the uh, yesterday's story of classics of American fiction 19th century we did the earlier part, uh, first half of the 19th century. Today we'll do the later half. First half, both in Europe and, American, uh, and America, is known for romanticism. And that's why the books that we discussed yesterday were mostly historical romances, uh, because Romanticism was predominant in the earlier part of the 19th century, both in Europe as well as America. But in the later half of the century, uh, new movements in literature come up. Uh, first comes realism and then comes naturalism. So the books that we are going to discuss today uh, fall under these categories of realism, and naturalism rather than romanticism. The first uh, uh, classic in this series is Henry James's The Portrait of a Lady, which came out in 1881. Quite late in the century, 1881, Henry James was a prolific writer. He wrote um, over 20 uh, novels, a lot of short stories, and was a major American writer of the period. Uh, formally speaking, he is neither a romantic nor a realist, and much less the naturalist. But he does share uh, qualities of both realism as well as Romanticism. Uh, romantic because uh, he focuses on the sensibility, on the private and personal experience of his characters, which is the domain of Romanticism. Whereas realism focuses on the public life, social life. So here uh, we have in the portrait of a lady, uh, the portrait of Isabel Archer. Isabel Archer is a young American girl and she is looking for a free space where she could do things she liked. That idea of freedom. And in that sense, she becomes representative of our nation also, because America also came about in search of a similar sort of freedom. But then nothing comes without a cost. And as she goes along in life, she experiences what life is like. It's not that simple, not that easy as she had thought of it. So on the way, uh, she meets two young people. Uh, both start loving her, and both want to marry her. 
but she doesn't accept the proposals and finally lends herself into a home of which is full of corruption evil sin gilbert osmond is the man she finally chooses to marry and uh, she is made almost like the bird in the cage a prisoner all her freedom is taken away by this man and then she gradually discovers that he has still and had before the marriage also an affair with another woman and uh, not only that he also has a child a girl grown up now by that woman so all this comes a horror to isabel archer innocent girl looking for freedom finally lending herself in the head into the into the trap of a crook uh, a sinner now he is a man who comes from europe and he has a facade around him of being an art lover and therefore he has decorated his home office himself with art and artifacts of europe ancient medieval later renaissance so on and so forth so she is taken in by those appearances but the reality behind the appearances turns out to be very ugly horrifying and uh, that's how the novel ends tragically so henry james very rightly is called the novelist of sensibility uh, here is a girl who is a girl with very keen very sensitive is herself and she is looking for that delicate space in life but instead she gets something thorny full of thorns rather than uh, any innocence now henry james also brings in a larger contrast between europe and america now gilbert osmond represents the european civilization whereas isabel archer represents the american civilization american civilization being very new because the settlement came about in the 17th century and civilization started growing up in the 18th and in the 19th it can call itself a separate nation and civilization whereas europe has had thousands of years behind its back and the civilization has not only grown old it has grown decadent it has degenerated it has corrupted and all that is represented by gilbert osmond so both the characters become representatives of two different civilizations one young and the other old the lesson ultimately that the novel teaches is that things do start as young but things do grow as old and with age with experience uh, all sorts of things creep in and you do not remain nor can you remain as pure as you started or you thought you would be able to maintain your purity so ultimately uh, she gets disenchanted and there the novel ends so this is one of the great american classics uh, in the uh, american novel and james of course is one of the major american novelists so as we can see so far as the focus on the sensibility of an individual focus on the inner life of a character 
focus on the private and personal life is concerned, all these elements come from romance, from the romantic movement of the early 19th century. But then the details of life that Henry James gives in the novel, uh, they are in the style of realism. Because realism, the philosophy of realism in literature, uh, believed in giving details of everyday life, how one lives, what does one do the whole day and so on. So uh, this is a combination of uh, romantic elements as well as the realist elements. And that's why it's a kind of threshold, it's a kind of uh, transfer from one movement into another. Now, uh, the next in line uh, I would like to talk about Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which again is a classic uh, of its own kind. This came out in 1885, and it is uh, a sequel, sequel to another novel by Mark Twain called The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Now this is Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Both characters are there in both the novels. They were there in Tom Sawyer, they are there here also in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. The difference here is uh, that in the earlier novel, there were just, uh, you see, more of fun items of the youth. And they were playing around and uh, showing life, what it was like in America around the river Mississippi, which is a great river which runs through the heart of America, so to say, uh, touching upon the major states. Uh, in, uh, in uh, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Mark Twain takes up the sensitive subject of slavery also. Uh, because when uh, fed up with home life, which was a sort of training in uh, getting civilized, Huckleberry Finn runs away from home. The boy is so fed up with uh, his aunt and other women in the family who are trying to educate him into manners, morals, so on and so forth. So he runs away. He goes to Jackson Island. And there on the island, he uh, meets a runaway slave. Uh, mm, a runaway uh, uh, slave, he's nigger Jim. You see, Negroes were called niggers out of contempt. And he's hiding himself because the moment he is seen by any white man, he will be captured and taken back uh, to the town and then tortured for trying to escape uh, slavery. In fact, in 1850, uh, they had enacted a law in America that whoever tries to help the runaway slaves will be given severe punishment, etc., etc. So uh, the law had been made all the more stringent, and that was in the favor of slave keeping and against those who were trying to. Uh, liberate the slaves. Uh, yesterday we did the last novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, she was the writer, imagine. And she was the first one to muster courage against slavery. And she wrote that powerful novel which brought about a sort of revolution, not only in America, in Europe also. As I told, 1867, the second reform bill in England, 
see in favor of workers and so on. So similarly, Mark Twain in line with Mrs. Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, he also brings in the theme of slavery. And there is a great companionship between the runaway uh, nigger Jim and the runaway uh, uh, boy uh, Huckleberry Finn. They become great friends. It's a community of two. It is a family of two. And it is a country of two. So Jackson Island becomes an alternate to uh, the American continent. That America has gone wrong. It has fallen into the same trap as Europe did. And all degeneration and corruption are now following. So uh, a sort of uh, purity of companionship between the black and white uh, in human terms, that is what Mark Twain does. But unfortunately, after chapter 42, uh, he loses courage, it seems, and sends back nigger Jim and sends back the boy to the town. So they are back to scare one where they had started. So that idea of freedom is sacrificed. That's why D.H. Lawrence was very critical of Mark Twain. He said it was a great novel up to uh, chapter 42, but you stop there, don't go beyond. Because after chapter 42, it is all cheating. And uh, uh, he's falsifying the experience, falsifying the very story that he had started with. That is why Lawrence had said a remarkable thing. He had said, uh, never trust the artist, trust the tale, the story. So here is the case in point. And it is in this very context that he had said that. That if you go by the tale, it was going in one way, in the direction of freedom. But if you go by the artist's own decision, now he closes the door on both the runaway slave as well as this boy who was also trying to escape the, the tyranny of so-called civilization. So the, this is another great book, uh, another classic. The third book I would like to talk about is uh, The Rise of Silas Lepham, L-A-P-H-A-M. 1885 again, the same year, William Dean Howells, H-O-W-E-L-L-S. Well, Howells was a, a theoretician of the novel also. <clears throat> Formerly, in fact, on both sides of the uh, Atlantic, uh, in Europe as well as America. He uh, was the one who gave the theory of realism. So he's a theorist of uh, uh, realism in literature, how it is different from romanticism. Uh, it is, in fact, an inversion of rom romanticism, a reversal of that. And all that was unusual supernatural, extraordinary in the romantic world. Now uh, it is a familiar world that the novelists would like to describe, to narrate uh, everyday life, everyday sort of characters. So nothing extraordinary, nothing supernatural. Uh, that is the difference between romance and reality. And Howells theorized uh, about realism and his essay on reality and realism is accepted as the authentic uh, uh, philosophy of realism in literature. Now, the rise of Silas Lefum is an interesting case. It's a case of 
from rags to riches. <clears throat> you see, Silas uh, begins as a boy who paints houses. So labor, uh, doing uh, as a menial work of painting. But then from there, he rises to become a tycoon, a big name, big money. Now what Howells is trying to do is uh, giving you the inside story of uh, America's industrial development. Because in the later 19th century, America had become an industrial society. It was no longer agrarian, no longer uh, nature being dominant as it was in the romantic literature. Now it is industry. So what Howells is trying to show is that the inside of this industrial society is stinking. How people become rich overnight, how people make money, the ways are murky, the ways are surreptitious, the ways are suspect. So this is what he exposes in the novel uh, through the story of Silas Leffen. So it is the story in a way of America's industrialization. America's development, development into an industrial society, a dominant one, not only in the Western world, but now all over in the entire globe. So uh, this is exposed by William Dean Howells in The Rise of Silas Leffen. So uh, the word rise itself is ironic. It is satirical how one rises and what kind of rise. He rises in terms of money, in terms of status, but he falls in terms of morality, in terms of spirituality, in terms of values. So uh, this is the third uh, great uh, classic that uh, we would like to enlist for today. Now, the next one is by Stephen Crane, uh, The Red Badge of Courage, uh, 19, uh, sorry, 1895, uh, almost close to the century's end. Stephen Crane himself was a very poor boy to begin with, born in a very poor family and diseased like Keats was, suffering from consumption, TB. And like Keats, he died young at the age of 29. So poverty leading to consumption, fatal disease in those days. These days it's very easy, there's treatment for six months. Those days no treatment, it was fatal like cancer. And he died at the age of 29. But he left behind some very great uh, uh, writings. Uh, both uh, long narratives, novels, as well as short narratives, short stories. Uh, the, uh, 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 the, this novel, the, uh, uh, the Red Badge of Courage, 1895, uh, actually relates to uh, the Civil War, 1865. America had that Civil War and that Civil War came about between the liberal North and the conservative South. 
and the issue was slavery, whether or not to continue with slavery. The South did not want to uh, leave slavery because their entire agriculture depended upon the um, slaves. It is they who were doing the work. So the uh, uh, Civil War came about. Finally, of course, the liberal North won the war. And thereafter, the nation became united. Thereafter, it came, it came to be called United States of America. So all the 52 states became one nation, one country. So this is behind the novel Red Badge of the Red Badge of Courage. And um, uh, here is a youthful uh, hero, uh, Henry Fleming. Henry Fleming is very young, like Stephen Crane himself. And uh, he's very enthusiastic. And uh, he is inspired by the idea of a nation, and he thinks he is fighting a great war. But you see, uh, the novelist shows, Stephen Crane shows, how the boy fails at the crucial moment. He is novel, uh, not able to act, he fails in action. So, his enthusiasm, his excitement, ultimately does not lead to any success. On the contrary, it leads to failure. So the red badge is all right, but he lacks courage. The badge spoke for courage, but actually it would turned out to be lack of courage. So Henry Fleming uh, loses courage at the crucial moment. And uh, this is what uh, um, Stephen Crane wants to show. Perhaps from his own life, he had learned that lesson, that the, the circumstances, the environment in which one is brought up, uh, that plays its part. That is what naturalism was. After realism, naturalism. Naturalism was highly influenced by the ideas of Darwin, Spencer, Huxley. These were the evolutionaries who gave the idea of uh, species struggling for existence. You remember two principles of Darwin and Darwin uh, and Darwin's theory of existence, theory of evolution. One is the struggle for existence, that all these species of life, beginning with the smallest one, may be end uh, and up to the biggest animal, it may be even whale or elephant all are involved in protecting themselves. Each species wants to survive. So survival instinct is common to all, and it is very strong in all. The second principle is discovered was survival of the fittest, that all species do not survive, not forever. Species come and go. Even the biggest animal, rhinoceros, uh, is on the verge of being extinct. We have had uh, uh, great uh, uh, other animals who are no longer there. So uh, species also lose existence. It is on these ideas that the literary movement called naturalism came about. First uh, practitioners of realism, uh, sorry, naturalism were in France, uh, Balzac, Zola, 
Stendhal, uh, these were the uh, uh, novelists who wrote following these principles of evolution and showed how uh, humans are not their own masters. You can't do things you want to do. After all, you are also living in an environment and that environment is deterministic. So, the vision of the naturalist novelists, writers is deterministic. That life is determined by where one is born, by the place, by the environment, by the family, by the nation, by the religion. So many factors come into play. So, environment does not mean the physical environment. Environment means all these forces put together which are working upon you and are determining the course of your life. So, humans are not free, not at all, absolutely. So, they are made like any other species by their environment. So, with these ideas in the later 19th century, uh, there came about lot of novelists in Europe as well as in America. In America, William Dean Howells is known for uh, uh, realism, but Frank Norris is known for naturalism. Stephen Crane also known for naturalism. So, the red badge of courage is one of the naturalist novels in the American canon and a great novel at that. Although, uh, as I keep saying, uh, nothing is absolute, nothing is pure. It may be human nature, it may be a literary genre, it may be uh, individual writer or individual book. You will find always several elements mixing and making an amalgamation into a certain form. That is what literature is. So, you can't say it is a pure naturalist novel. The Red Badge of Courage also has the kind of romantic enthusiasm that you find in the historical romances of the early 19th century because Henry Fleming uh, is uh, quite uh, a young man, a hero of that type. At the same time, the novel is not leaving out the inner life of the hero. In fact, there is greater focus on the inner life, the sensitivity of the hero, what happens to his aspiration, what happens to his courage. Why does it fail him at the crucial moment? So, it is a study of inner life, <coughs> sorry, as much as uh, of the external life or public life. So, nothing is absolute, nothing is pure. In literature as well as life, things remain mixed. The only thing that decides the label, uh, we try to uh, have labels or fix labels because that simplifies things. Uh, classification is one of the ways of simplifications, but then that is also necessary because that helps you understand a particular uh, case, a particular movement and that is uh, uh, what is about the red wedge of courage also. You find that uh, we fix the label on it of a naturalist novel, but at the same time it is not without the elements of romance in it. So, a mixture predominantly it may be uh, naturalist, but it is not without the elements of romance. And that brings us to the last uh, book for today, Theodore Dreiser's Sister Carrie. Sister Carey, Theodore Dreiser. 
Uh, Dreiser also falls in the same category of the naturalists. Uh, and rightly, uh, the novel comes at the end of the century, 1900. So end of the century, end of the movement, 20th century will come up with new kind of literature, uh, mostly determined by World War I. And uh, as Willa Cather used to say, a novelist of the early 20th century, the world fell apart after World War One, So uh, the 19th century world no longer could continue in the 20th. So rightly, uh, Sister Carey comes at the end of the century, 1900. And uh, uh, Theodore Dreiser gives the story of uh, a woman or young girl who is left to fend for herself. She has no support from around. It may be family or anyone else. So to survive in a world which is now not only industrialized, it is getting commercialized. Now money is becoming the value and morality is being now sacrificed, is being uh, ignored, is being forgotten. So how to survive in such a world where money alone or success alone matter? So whatever the means you adopt, whatever the ways you take to, the only thing is that you should achieve your target of uh, becoming successful, becoming rich. These were the two parameters only to judge uh, the status of a person. So it is in this world that Sister Carey is caught up. And um, For her survival, she goes from one man to another, to another, and so on, uh, leaving behind a series of men, but always uh, going ahead for greater success, for, great, for more money, and therefore uh, choosing a man who is richer than the earlier one. So it is this kind of life that she is forced into. And at the end of the day, she realizes how pathetic her whole life has been. So Theodore uh, 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 Dreiser also exposes the mystique of uh, success the mystique of status in this industrialized, commercialized, developed so-called society of America. So uh, what has been gained on one hand, on the other, something has been sacrificed. Uh, going back to Henry James, Henry James was in the line of Matthew Arnold, contemporaries, both of them. And Henry James, in fact, in search of culture, had migrated to England. He thought America was not civilized enough. He didn't have really the culture, the sensitive uh, set of values one should live by. And there were crudities uh, in the American life where Nothing mattered except money and success. So he had left that. And we know Matthew Arnold's idea of culture, that it is the most refined way of life, a set of spiritual values 
by which one should live. That should be the ideal. So he makes out a difference between, between civilization and culture. That civilization is material. What progress you have made industrially, commercially, money-wise, so on and so forth. But culture relates to the spiritual progress. What are your values to live by? Are you a better human being, a superior human being? That determines uh, your status. So moral and spiritual status as against the, the, the uh, mon monetary status or social status. So uh, this tragic story of Sister Carey, uh, Dreiser wants to drive home the same message to, through the tragic tale of this girl who had to make all sorts of compromises, who had to sell her body to make do in life, to succeed in life, in fact to even to survive in life. She had to make those compromises, and that, uh, that, is, that was the only way to, left to her. There were no other means of earning survival and so on. So uh, these were the five books I thought we should uh, know, because they are great books. They are classics of uh, not only American literature, but I would say world literature. And the position of woman, as we had seen, uh, uh, yesterday also, uh, is also uh, one of the very serious themes in these novels. Here again, it exposes. You may have made uh, a big uh, uh, success uh, commercially. You may have become a dominant country industrially. But how about the culture? What kind of people are you? What is the place of woman in this society? So these questions are raised uh, by the men of letters. That's why uh, one of the senators in the 19th century had said that uh, when 1850 uh, uh, law was passed in favor of slave keepers, then he had said, he said, men of letters, writers, they are always on the other side. They are on the side of justice, fairness, and that is why you find anti-slavery novels, and you find, uh, you see, uh, pro-woman novels, because these were the two big issues in the 19th century. Uh, the slave trade, the position of the Negroes, and the position of women. And these two continue to be the running themes through all these 10 great books that we have discussed five yesterday and five today. Thank you. With this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for giving us a very productive session. And uh, as we talked about the naturalism and realism all together, uh, and if you're talking about the uh, classics of uh, American fiction, and if you want to demarcate uh, with a thin line between the naturalism and realism, how would we do so? Well, uh, realism is a general emphasis on depicting real life in literature. Whatever life we every day live, if that life is described rather than the unusual kind of incidents, rather than supernatural beings or legendary beings as we have in the epic, larger than life-size heroes in Mahabharata or Ramayana, on and so forth. Now that is not realism. Realism is ordinary people you meet in daily life and how they live, what they do. If you describe that, that becomes realism. Now naturalism also emphasizes everyday life, but then they have a theory. Realism does not have 
a definite theory. Naturalism is inspired by, inspired by a theory. And that theory, as I said, is Darwinian. So Darwin is at the center, at the back of uh, the naturalistic philosophy in literature. And they very closely follow the role of environment in the growth of the individual character as well as a community or a nation. Or just as Darwin studied the role of environment and how there is a struggle for existence and how there is a survival of the fittest. So naturalism follows these uh, laws of evolution, whereas there is no such definite philosophy behind realism. And it is just a general emphasis as against romanticism. So this came about in reaction against romanticism. Because in romanticism, uh, you always wrote about the unusual, extraordinary, supernatural, superhuman, so on and so forth. So from the extraordinary to the ordinary. Uh, as we always say that uh, literature is the mirror of the society in some way or the mm -hmm. another. Uh, we tend to get um, the clear image of the society which we haven't seen but with the help of the books, with the help of the novels, with the help of the literature. Uh, we uh, try to understand and we could see uh, that uh, era. So can we say that yes, American uh, literature gave the full uh, viewpoint or the full reflection of the uh, problems or the uh, conditions which were prevalent at that time? Well, yes, every literature does, some less, some more, because all books would not be alike, and all writers would not be alike. Some writers are ideologically oriented, left or right, conservative or radical. Um, some have scientific orientation, some have economic orientation, some have artistic orientation, so on and so forth. So n number of writers and uh, as large a variety of writings you have. <coughs> but one way or another, as you said, uh, literature holds mirror up to nature. Uh, this comes from Shakespeare in his play Hamlet. Uh, Hamlet is giving instructions to the actors. He says, don't speak very loudly like donkeys, nor very subdued. So keep the level tone as it happens in real life, as if, as it were, you were showing mirror up to nature. So he uses that phrase. So literature holds mirror up to nature, but then there are ways and ways of holding the mirror. Where are you holding it? At what a distance? From what angle? So both the distance and the angle would matter, whether it is left angle or right angle, whether it is a distant view or a close view of reality. So all these factors would come into play. And that's why there's a difference between book and book, writer and writer. So sir, other than the <coughs> slavery or the women issues, were there any other issues which were depicted or which we could uh, see in the uh, American literature? Well, these are the major ones, uh, the slavery and uh, position of women. Uh, but then, before that, in the 18th century and partly in the uh, early 19th century also, uh, like Fanny Moore, Coopers, or uh, um, uh, Irving's uh, novels, uh, we find uh, there is another important theme, theme of the Red Indian. Because when the Europeans came to America in the 17th century. Uh, they inflicted the same, in fact, more cruelties on the Red Indians. 
which later they did on the Negroes, on the blacks. Now they are called African Americans. So uh, that is also depicted in the early American novels by Fannie Moore Cooper and uh, by uh, Irving. Uh, we uh, talked about them yesterday, like uh, the conquest of Grenada by Irving and Fannie Moore's uh, Cooper's novels. He wrote so many leather stocking novels, they were called, and all dealing with the life of the Red Indians. So that also remained an important theme in American literature. And also, America itself is a theme in American literature, in American novel also, because it's a new nation and they are very self-conscious about that. So they are writing with that self-consciousness. And Englishmen will not be self-conscious. They are too sure of themselves. And in fact, if at all there is any consciousness, it is that of superiority. They will still look down upon the Americans as a new a novice nation, not very cultured, not very civilized, so there is a feeling of superiority. On the other side, among the Americans, uh, there still continues to be a, a feeling of self-consciousness. You are new, you are not as old as Europeans, you always look up to them for learning. It may be literature, it may be life. So they have been, now of course America dominates. But then somewhere mm, there, in their culture as well as individually, that feeling remains. They always look up to Europe for any kind of guidance. Sir, as we have seen and um, we know also that a writer has a close connection with the society. After seeing the society, after understanding the various aspects, uh, uh, after creating various perspective of the uh, issues prevalent in the society, the writer writes. Were there any uh, writers who uh, himself or herself have become victim of those issues and then they wrote up? Yes, uh, there were. Uh like uh, Stephen Crane himself, victim of poverty. You see, on the one hand, there is industrial boom. Business is flourishing. America is getting rich, dominant. But there are people, great writer, dies out of poverty, in fact, like Keats was poor and died the same way, consumption. Similarly, there were black writers. Uh, they come up uh, more in the 20th century, like Richard Wright, who wrote that famous novel, Native Son. And then Ralph Ellison, uh, who wrote um, uh, Invisible Man, because he said, the only way to survive for a black man in America is to remain invisible, not to be seen. The moment that you are seen, they will catch you and make you a slave or torture you, do all kinds of things. So uh, these were the people who had tasted that life, who had undergone that suffering and that, uh, you see, oppression of the white dominant community and they described all that in their writings. That's uh, the way we can say that after suffering that pain, it uh, uh, was one of the cause, it was one of the motivation for some of the writers uh, who could write or uh, give best out of their best. So as uh, we have uh, very less time left over here, uh, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Bhim Sen Dahiya for giving us a very productive session. Dear friends, if you have any queries or if you want to give your feedback regarding this particular lecture, then you can mail us at info.cc at the rate nic.in. 
and if you want to access this lecture so dear friends we are going to upload this lecture very soon on the youtube with the help of this you can watch this lecture number of times you wanted on youtube and after that you can send your queries uh, your mails to us at info.cc at the rate nice.in with this note thank you sir thank you so very much thank you Thank you.